Good morning, Endeavor. I think you stumped the crew. Uh, we give up on that one. Darth Vader. The flight director says it has a good beat. It's easy to dance to. He gives it about a 40. Well, we liked it. We just uh, we just couldn't identify it. Endeavour Houston, we see everyone on the flight deck there. You're looking great. Best we can do, Tom. Time to get those uh, combs and razors out for homecoming. Yeah, we clean up real good. Endeavor, we're watching. Okay, Tom, we're picking up with uh, A1 on over. Copy. Roger Endeavor, here's my colleague. Good morning, Brian. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Fine, thanks. You look like you're having a great time up there, and you're doing a wonderful job. Well, thanks. We're ready to come home, too. It's always hard to leave, but uh, we, you know how it is. You look forward to coming back. Yes, all good things must come to an end, and I'm here to brief you a little bit about that. Uh, what we've got is we've got some great weather for you both Saturday and Sunday at both landing sites. We will be bringing up KSC only on Saturday with two opportunities there. We're setting up for a right-hand turn to runway 33. I'll go ahead and give you the weather at, at KSC for Saturday. Looking at uh, 3,000 scattered, 7 plus miles visibility. Winds 340, 10 peak 18, and we've got prevailing northerly winds for the entire south of the United States. And it will be a little bit chilly when you uh, climb out of the vehicle. Go ahead, Tom. Roger, Brian, we're trying to uh, deplete O2 tank 4. We'd like you to configure a single heater in O2 tank 3. So on R1, cryo O2 tank 3 heater alpha. Auto. Okay. Tank three, O2 tank three, heater alpha is an auto. Endeavor Houston, are you ready for the event? Houston, we're ready for the event. KSC PAO, this is Houston. Please call Endeavor for a voice check. Endeavor, this is KSC PAO. How do you hear me? KSC PAO, we're reading you loud and 
clear. All right, thank you. And uh, do you have an opening statement you'd like to make for us? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, the mission's been extremely successful to this point, and um, the six crew members you're looking at right now couldn't be more happy uh, to have been part of the team that pulled off this mission, STS-72. Uh, we believe that the, uh, the mission itself is a testament to the, the teamwork uh, all across NASA and also the international cooperation between the uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Japanese Space uh, Agency. So we're, uh, we're very happy to be part of that team. Uh, things have gone very well. It's all uh, has gone this well because of the great planning and the flexibility that's been demonstrated by everyone uh, throughout. So uh, we're happy to accomplish the mission to this point, and we're looking forward to coming home. All right, thank you, Endeavor, and we'll proceed now with questions. This is Phil Chun, Earth News, for anybody who wants to take it. Uh, what has the Earth looked like on this mission? How much detail can you see? Uh, what's the smallest thing you can see out the windows, either from inside or outside the cabin? Yeah, so I'll let one of the new guys in particular, uh, Dan Barry, I think, has been uh, pretty awestruck by the view of the Earth. I'll let him answer that one. I really have been uh, thunderstruck by the, the beauty of the Earth, both from uh, inside the cabin and outside during an EVA. Uh, I was trying to, to find words to describe it. The only thing I can compare it to is the, the color of gemstone. I, I mentioned in an earlier conference that uh, while I was outside, the blues ranged from midnight blue to turquoise. The forests were emerald green. The clouds were so bright, they were hard to look at. It has just been an amazing uh, experience to be able to see the Earth, to see the stars that you can see uh, when the flight deck is uh, darkened, and the sunrises and sunsets are particularly spectacular. Uh, Bill Harwood with CBS News for Winston Scott, I think, or, or Leroy Chow. Um, based on your assessment of uh, the, the performance of the suits, the thermal characteristics, the tools, and all of the stuff you guys tested during your two EVAs, um, how ready is NASA to go build station? How much is left to do? Can you give us kind of a a midterm report based on how everything went? Well, uh, from the suit standpoint, I can tell uh, tell you I'm very, very pleased with the performance of the suit. As I was standing on that old impetch for uh, 60 minutes, 30 or so were in the darkness, I again felt uh, very, very comfortable. Uh, obviously, you can tell some thermal gradient. Uh, my fingertips were a little warmer than the palms, but that's to be expected, you know, and just as an example. But overall, I felt very good in the suit. I could have continued to work in the suit reg regardless of the uh, temperatures. So I would say we, we certainly have a good baseline from which we can uh, uh, go on and do our work. Obviously, you always want to look for improvements, but I think we're to the point where we can uh, take that suit airborne and begin to construct the station with it. Uh, both uh, both EVAs were EVA development flight tests were extremely successful. Uh, not only did we get three more uh, people in our astronaut office experience in spacewalking, we also proved on uh, on EVA one that the macro size hardware is going to work very well, and on EVA two that more of the detailed tools are also going to work very well. We were surprised by a few small things that uh, didn't work quite like we had expected, and we were also pleasantly surprised by some things that worked much better than we expected. So it was a very successful flight test. We learned a lot. It's going to feed right back into the space station and the space station program, and uh, we're ready to go build it. Peter Galtieri with the West Kentucky News. Uh, for any of the spacewalkers, uh, how uh, valuable would it be if you guys could control the movement of the arm right when you're hanging at the end of it there instead of having someone uh, directing you? Well, I'll, I'll answer one part of that, then I'll hand off to uh, Brent Jett, who was... Uh, the prime arm operator during our EVAs to answer the rest. But uh, from my perspective, uh, everything I asked Brent to do, he did perfectly. In fact, uh, I think the three of us agree that pretty much uh, he and Koichi, who was also operating the arm at times, uh, could read our minds and know exactly where we need to be. And they had a good perspective out the window and with cameras as well to very, you know, position us exactly where we needed to be. So I don't think it was that important. I don't think it's important that we be able to control the arm ourselves. But, uh, you know, the coordination worked great. Uh, from the arm operator's perspective, um, I would say that it would be very difficult to have an EVA person uh, controlling the arm. With their limited field of view, 
they're not able to see all the joints of the arm, so uh, the arm operator is responsible for maintaining clearance from any other orbiter structure. We were working in some fairly tight areas up in the forward payload bay, so I think the way we have it right now that uh, is, it works really well. The training we get is uh, excellent, and I think we're able to uh, accomplish the mission uh, very efficiently. This is Phil Chen again for Leroy. Uh, you've been usually a fairly laid-back person, but I heard you go, oh, wow, during uh, one of the spacewalks, and then uh, about 15 seconds uh, later say, okay, back to work. And this is over Africa during daytime, not towards the Terminator. I'm just wondering what you saw and what was so oh, oh wow about it. I believe the moment you were talking about, uh, I was looking at an excellent view of Australia. It was a, an oblique shot of uh, Australia. It was very clear, and Shark's Bay was uh, very, very clearly in view. I think that's the moment when I when I said that. Uh, Bill Harwood for Commander Duffy, I think. Uh, obviously, ten years, af ten years of progress here after 51L and looking ahead to the future, we stand ready to transition over to a single prime contract. I know there's some concern that as that transition takes place, a lot of the safety issues that were put in after 51L may be eroded uh, to some extent because of budget cuts or whatever. What are your thoughts about that? Are, are you concerned um, is that transition approaches on how safety gets maintained and how you manage the program? No, Bill, we're, we know that the process of change, which is ongoing, um, you know, it will occur. Uh, we have every confidence, however, that we're not going to forget the lessons that we have learned. We will bring forward with us um, all of the procedures and the process changes that we made after 51L to ensure that we continue to fly safely. So we don't think we're going to lose anything uh, in the process. You know, we're, we do have to live within the budget constraints that we're faced with. We think we can do it safely. We think we can get the job done, and we're looking forward to the challenge of doing it. Pete Galtieri with the West Kentucky News. Uh, this is for anyone uh, who saw that uh, Delta launch. Uh, we, when you guys passed over, were you able to actually see the uh, the rocket itself, or was it just the uh, the contrail and the cloud that you saw? And can you explain a little bit more about that cloud? How high was it uh, that it appeared to you? I know I saw some of the video, but if you can explain it, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. I can I can tell you what we saw. Uh, we were looking out the uh, the commander's uh, window, sort of to the left of the flight deck, and saw an oblong ball of light sitting up above the atmosphere. Uh, it was uh, too large to be a star. It almost looked like the moon rising. And uh, as we watched it, it became uh, brighter and then started to stretch out into a line. And uh, since Houston had alerted us that uh, Delta rocket was going to be launched and uh, we knew the location we were looking was uh, right toward Florida, uh, we surmised that it was, in fact, the uh, Delta launch and continued to watch it. It stretched out into a long, linear uh, white line, which then faded into red and then finally uh, speckled red and then uh, as the sun rose, uh, faded away. This is Mike Drago of the Associated Press for Commander Duffy. What are your thoughts on the night landing and could you tell us some of the, the piloting, the different piloting challenges that you face on a night or day landing? Well, I'm looking forward to the night landing. It's something that uh, we've trained for. Uh, Brent and I have been training now for the, you know, the better part of a year to do that. Uh, we've flown hundreds of approaches at night. Um, I don't think that it'll be all that different from uh, from a day landing, to tell you the truth. I've had some people that have uh, made night landings before tell me that it's actually a little bit easier just because you don't have all the other things in your visual um, uh, range uh, to distract you at all, and all you have is the, the lit runway and the center line and the lights lighting up the touchdown zone. So I'm very excited about doing it. I've been training for it for a long time, uh, and I don't think it's going to be particularly difficult. Uh, this is a question to Commander Duffy from Michael Doden of NHK. Um, SCS-72 was an international mission with Koichi on board as mission specialist. How would you evaluate his asset as mission specialist? And did difference in nationality, culture, and ideology matter at all, if any? Koichi is, uh, is one of the crew, and he's fit in very well uh, here, and, and we haven't noticed that there, 
or any cultural uh, differences, uh, when there are some things that we can talk about where Americans do things different uh, than the Japanese people, we enjoy actually having the opportunity to compare uh, the two outlooks and the two ways that people uh, would, would view the same thing. Uh, throughout the training, however, and certainly not in the flight, has that caused any problem whatsoever? Um, and I don't think I... I think as long as we have people that are that like to get along with each other and have a common goal and work together, um, that cultural differences won't be a significant problem. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, uh, Brian, on R2U, uh, could you characterize any uh, hydrazine you see coming out of the thruster? We'd like to get an idea if it's visible at all. We can't see anything on the downlink. Okay, stand by. Okay, Tom, a little word on the RTU. Go ahead. Yeah, before the, we started the uh, crew conference, um, Dan took a look at it, and he said that the, the leak was substantially less than that, uh, which we had seen earlier. And right now, under the lighting conditions that we have out right now, which is, you know, bright sunlight, we can't see anything coming out of it. Roger, Brian, our temperature trends indicate that uh, it's been decreasing. It's probably minute uh, in quantity now, so very little oxidizer should be escaping. We had a concern that uh, some smart ice, partic ice particles might be uh, in the way of the SLA experiment and uh, be a concern for the cockpit, but we don't think that's the problem now. So as soon as the water problem is cleared up downstairs, we're going to maneuver and continue with SLA lasing, if you concur. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Tom. That sounds like a great idea. And we're, uh, right now we've got uh, a couple of extensions and uh, some dry wipes down in there. We're, we're trying to stop it up. We'll let you know very quickly. Thank you. Endeavour Houston, Orbit One shift is turning it over to the Falcon team with Rob and Story. We think you'll have smooth sailing into Florida on Saturday morning, so this will be our last shift with you. It has been an immense pleasure for Orbit One, and Brian says that we've used up about all the plans we had taken along on this flight. If you have any left over, you can stow those. We're on the nominal timeline for entry. Great job, congratulations, and we'll see you back at Ellington from all the team here. Thanks, Tom. We'd, uh, we'd like to congratulate Brian on uh, what a terrific first mission he's had as the lead flight director. Uh, and all those plans that he had in his book, uh, we put most of them to use. Uh, it's a good thing he thought ahead as much as he had, and uh, he got a lot of help from from you and from everybody else in the room and all of the all the folks in the back rooms. And uh, we sure appreciate everything uh, that you all did for us. It's been an unbelievable mission, and. Uh, can't wait to see you guys back home and we can talk a little more about it. We'll do that over a beer. Thanks. You got a deal. We'll even buy it for you. I wrote that down.
Endeavor for SLA. Houston Endeavor, go ahead for SLA. We'd like an SLA disabled, page 6-4, please, Winston. Okay, and uh, an evening story, a good morning story. Believe it or not, I was waiting on your call. I've got that procedure in my hand, and I'll put it in work. Thanks very much, Winston.